Yeah, Ganesh, you are here, right? Have we started the live streaming? Yes, yes. Yeah, all right. All right. Namaste and a very good evening, everyone. I am your today's host, Rugwe Dupadhe, and I welcome you all on behalf of Think India and Think India Writers Forum in this book launch and a candid conversation of the book, Who Kill Shastri, written by none other than Sri Vivek Agniotri. Although Vivek ji needs no introduction, I consider it my duty to remind us all what a person par excellence sir is, with his expertise in various fields. Sir is an award-winning film director, screenwriter, and a best-selling author. He is a board member of India's Central Board of Film Certification, CBFC. Sir is the first person from the film industry to be appointed as a cultural representative at the Indian Council for Cultural Relations the apex body on the promotion of Indian culture across the world. He has directed multiple stimulating films, including Buddha in a Traffic Jam and The Tashkent Files, and has written thought-provoking books like Urban Nuxials and Who Killed Shastri. He is a strong voice on contemporary issues concerning our country and makes a rich contribution to drive the discourse of our country in a positive direction. I, on behalf of Think India, welcome you, Vivek, sir, and thank you for joining us this evening. Namaskar. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah. Also, uh, I I would like to tell the audience, Vivek sir, that this is not our first asso association with you. We uh, we at Think India had the privilege to host you even in the past at the screening event of the film Buddha in a Traffic Jam at Pune University and the book launch of your book Urban Nuxials again in Pune. So, Vivek sir, we are delighted to have you back with us. Welcome again. Thank you. Thank you very much. In fact, um, I, I really love so many students who are associated with Think India. And I am constantly follow what uh, wonderful job you guys are doing. And I think organizations like Think India are the reason that people in India are still sane and evolving. All right. Well, Vivek sir, now before beginning the session, I would call upon Sri Mrutunjay Tripathi to give a brief introduction about Think India and our various activities. Uh, Shri Mrityanjay Tripathi ji is a full-timer and in charge of West Zone Think India. Uh, Mrityanjay ji, over to you. Uh, Rukwe ji. Yes, sir. Always a pleasure to have you with us and thank you so much for taking out time from your busy schedule and being here with us. Uh, before I start, I would just to, uh, introduce Think India to you. Came uh, with the idea of Think India in the year 2007. Came with the idea. We're in a group of students studying in Institute of Science and Premier Institute in Bangalore came up with the idea to, uh, to provide a platform to students studying in Premier Institute so that they can uh, network, they can connect. And one thing that stays by them is the is that nation comes first. With this attitude and with this notion in mind, Think India was formed in day 2007. Since then, we've been having, uh, we've developed and progressed over a period of time. I think India currently provides uh, a lot of internships to students studying in all premier institutes. To just give you a brief about the internship and uh, the number of students that trained so far, we've seen more than 10,000 students studying in national institutes on our internship, some of which are with the internship, which is a legal internship where we send students to work with leading uh, lawyers in various ways in different courts. Internship is the Niti internship. It is a policy based internship where we send students to work with policy think tanks that are really working as uh, I, a lot of videos we see of Vivek sir. Vivek sir talks about the real reason. Niche ground level Anubhuti internship is an internship where we send students to work with leading NGOs. Padmashri Ashok Bhagat ji, Grish Kulkarni ji, and people like him who are creating a difference in, in the real fragment of it. Uh, International Law Commission internship that I would like to brief you about, where we send students to work with Dr. Nirudh Rajput, who's an elected member at the United Nations in, uh, International Law Commission at Hague. We send students to work with him. Or thinking has been doing a lot of events, a lot of talks, a lot of conferences 
over the past years which has which it have, which has grown over a its impact on college campuses has also grown over a period of time i uh, screening being a volunteer when sirs screening uh, the first screening was happening in delhi on arts faculty so since then uh, continuously with the mix sir and uh, Uh, an internship that i forgot to brief you about is sansad the internship where we send students to work with the policy maker and government parliament so that students also learn and get a taste of and a hang of things how do policy how do legal work how do uh, legal work happen how do policies get made so uh, keeping all this in mind i think india has been working among uh, the national institute students organizing conferences organizing talks organizing various lectures that can help and bring about a discourse a debate a discussion among students this is all that i wanted to say uh, thank you so much for inviting me thank you so much vivek sir for having uh, for being here uh, it's a pleasure always to have you now i won't speak much because i know everyone's waiting for vivek sir to speak thank you sir all thank right. you so much thank you mrutyunjay ji and uh, just a small instruction uh, we'll be have we'll be taking audience questions as well so participants are requested to keep sending their questions in the chat box which i'll read out to sir at appropriate uh, at appropriate time now without further ado i request vivek sir to start today's conversation by telling us what prompted uh, you to take up this project of bringing the death mystery of india's second prime minister sri lal bahadur shastri ji in the contemporary political discourse over to you sir namaskar and thank you everybody for inviting me to this wonderful forum of think india i have always uh, found especially the young people very dynamic and no nonsense approach and for that i want to congratulate you in a world everybody just talks and nobody wants to do good ground work in this kind of an atmosphere to protect you from the hype and actually on the ground doing good work is a very rare quality and i must congratulate all the volunteers and the organizing members of think india from the bottom of my heart today i want to tell you about not just the book but what exactly made me get into this territory of investigative filmmaking i was growing up and i you there was a big problem in this country even now there is a problem i was in bhopal and i want every student who is listening to this to listen to this very very carefully because this is where lies the problem of this country both my parents were freedom fighters when i joined college in bhopal mvm there were two student bodies one was nsui another was abvp but i saw that whenever there was a argument or a fight those times you know students used to fight a lot there was used to be a lot of physical fights very often police would come inside the campus but whenever nsu's i students attacked or did something the news report was always that students had a clash with the administration agar aap shayad jante na ho us waqt mein kya hota tha कि स्टूडेंट्स जो है वो धरना दे देते थे प्रिंसिपल के ऑफिस के सामने और सारे क्लासेस कैंसिल करवा देते थे तो नेक्स्ट डे द न्यूज रिपोर्ट यूज टू बी दैट स्टूडेंट्स हैड अ क्लैश विद द एडमिनिस्ट्रेशन व्हेन द एबीवीपी स्टूडेंट्स डिड द सेम थिंग सेम थिंग डिड टू एग्जैक्टली द सेम थिंग द न्यूज रिपोर्ट वुड बी आउटसाइड गूंस came and protested or did a clash or something like that 
And though I was on the leftist side, not neither NSUI nor uh, ABVP, but it made an impression in my mind. Because I was, uh, I had any uh, leftist background. I was on the left side because I was always a seeker of truth. I always believed that in India, if India has to grow, we have to take our own values, strengthen Indian Bharti values. And I found NSUI very uh, westernized and there, I never agreed with that ideology. And somehow the leadership in my college of ABBP was also not great, you know because those students at that time spent a lot of time in college. So naturally, the leftist people at that time used to come and brainwash people like me, young students like me. They'll immediately tell me that, okay, we believe in socialism, everybody should be empowered, and the stories of exploitation of Dalits and blah, blah, what not, you know. You, you know the story. Uh, waste my time discussing that. But they were very smart in brainwashing. They will talk about the concepts of equality, freedom, all Western concepts. And when you are a young boy living in a society of scarcity, where the aspiration of collective aspiration of middle class was somehow to get rid of struggle and send their children to America or UK, 90% of the students with me were convent educated. I was from Kendri Vidyalaya. It's very easy as for a young boy to wanting to fit into that system. And which is why we start believing in the Western concepts of democracy, Western concepts of liberty, Western concepts of equality, Western concepts of feminism, and Western concept of revolution. So I was always disillusioned with the way media I was disillusioned with the way intellectuals, my professors and the principal and everybody was creating a narrative. I have written about it in detail in my book, Urban Access. As I grew up, I realized that the problem, the biggest problem in, in India is that we do not have access to truth. In this country, the biggest victim is the truth. What is truth? We encounter truth in two, three different ma manners. One is the primary truth. Primary truth is your own experiences in life and your own truth. What's your relationship with the world? You sit in meditation, you discover yourself, you discuss about your, you life and slowly you start finding the oneness of the universe that is personal private and very very primary but everybody is not capable of interpreting the primary truth because nobody is so evolved or nobody has so much of time in day-to-day -day struggle to live in this world people do not get time and normally by the time you start discovering the primary truth you are almost 50 60 70 years old but what happens to the youth of this country? Youth of this country has to depend on the secondary source of the truth. It's like to learn swimming, you have to swim yourself. But to know what is the correct way of swimming or not go into the depth of the sea, you may drown or there is undercurrent in this river. So don't. So the wise. It will tell you, beta, you are going to swim in Ganga, but don't go there because there is undercurrent or there are crocodiles there or it's very different, very difficult current over there. They will, you'll get washed off or the crocodiles will eat you up. So you learn from the experienced people. That is the secondary. And the third and the tertiary is primary reporting. Two crocodiles were sighted in the river, so you understand that, okay, you should not go there. Or it's going to rain tomorrow. It's going to be heavy monsoon tomorrow. The weather forecast tells you, so you don't cross the river because it can just bubble up or there can be flood in the river. You won't be able to come back. These are the simple three ways. So primary, 
secondary, tertiary. The most important in making up your mind are secondary and tertiary. Now, the secondary is or through government sources or through the free intellectual world. Now, the problem is that the government for 60, 70 years, which was Congress, was controlled by the colonial mindset and the colonial mindset was of Babus, of ICS officers who laid down. Yes, Baba Sahab definitely along with 15 great women and other men wrote the constitution. But if you look at our constitution is very, very heavily influenced by the British mindset. It does not take from Panchayati system. So we got entangled into a very bureaucratic process where government had complete co control over the information. On the second hand, government controlled education system also. And the Congress of that time did a barter system with the communists because Indira Gandhi needed the support of communists to survive. So therefore, Indira Gandhi had a very clear cut barter and kind of a deal with the communist party that, OK, you give me support. In return, I'll give you art, culture and education. And Professor Nurul Hassan became the education minister and he appointed all the communists and socialist people who were working directly under KGB and later on under China. They took control of this entire system, which tells us the history and through art, literature and cinema, which tells us the story and the socio-political perspective of the society. And the tertiary sector was media. Now the government and these intellectuals immediately realized that the best way to control the minds of the people is to control the media. And the KGB, the journalists, and took them under their fold. You must have noticed a very important point I'm telling you, you must have noticed that very often communists and these lefties always blame the nationalist people, the right wing people, all these boys and girls are of, of Think India, ABVP, basically the people who are Indians, that there are no intellectuals in the right wing. You must have noticed that. They always blame RSS of being not intellectual. Now let's just discover what is this intellectual thing. It simply means intellectuals have truth and people who don't have truth are non-intellectuals. But what is truth? Government, the Babus, IS officers, the education system, the media, all these people have control. The family, which suits KGB, which suits multinational companies, which suits capitalists, which suits the corrupt people. Now they are the custodians of the truth. The poor, simple, middle class people, the housewives, the teachers, overseers, clerks, all these people who are working hard to make this country strong day and night, people who actually got us freedom, suddenly they are told that you are not the custodian of the truth. So if you don't have the information, if you don't have the media, how can you have anything? Then it's very easy to pass on the blame and they say that these people are not intellectuals. But do you know that more than 90% of the scientists in India are nationalist people of the right, right ideology? Do you know that besides the main media of these English speaking media, if you go and see the local media in every city and villages and small towns, they are all nationalists. If you see the teachers at a lower level are all nationalists. If you look at all the most of the Hindi literature, Telugu literature, Tamil literature, you will find that the people who are not published by the international and the so-called glamorous publishing houses are all nationalists. And hard-working people and the intellectuals. I have also written two books. I am giving speeches at least 15, 20 times. I write columns in international magazines. I have given lectures in Oxford, Harvard, Yale, you name top universities of the world. I have gone and given lectures there. I would say 
I am not an intellectual. Why? Because they are building this uh, narrative. And this is the problem with this country that the truth and the information was captured, or I would say, by the corrupt governance of 60, 70 years. And that's where we lost. Who has done most uh, groundwork? You go anywhere in India, you see the real, real honest NGOs which are working on the ground are all nationalists and they will have the right wing ideology. And if you come to the cities, all these wine drinking NGOs who conduct their meetings in five star hotels, drinking champagne, who are least concerned about India or Indian people or groundwork, they are all of the communist or the Congress. They have got the support and the um, uh, moral support from Congress government or moral support from all these corrupt people. So India is divided between two people and there are people who want to control the idea of India. You understood? So there are people who just have what is called FEF English in slangs, means people who theoretically and intellectually have an idea of India and there are people if you look at them, their feet always have cracks. Their hands are wrinkled. Their faces are tanned because they are out in the sun working hard to build this India. And this truth nobody has told. The truth you are told outside goon students, NSUI students, whereas Akhil Bharti Vidyarthi Parishad ke naam mein shabde Vidyarthi. पर उनको विद्यार्थी नहीं माना जाता है जेएनयू में भी आपने रिसेंटली क्लैश हुआ था सब कह रहे थे कि आउटसाइड गुंस हैव कम इन मैं जब जादवपुर यूनिवर्सिटी गया था और मेरे ऊपर जब अटैक किया था तब भी मैं थिंक इंडिया के साथ ही वन कोऑर्डिनेट किया किया था सो द स्टूडेंट्स हु वर डूइंग माय स्क्रीनिंग वर द स्टूडेंट्स ऑफ जादवपुर यूनिवर्सिटी बट वेरी स्मॉल नंबर्स द आउटसाइड पीपल केम एंड अटैक मी and those outside people were, some of them were communist professors of some other college. But next day, on all TV news uh, in Calcutta, the news was that outside goons came and they were organizing the function. How is it possible for outside goons to come and organize the screening of Uddhana traffic? Jab tell me anybody in common sense can say that. So, lies are converted or made to be perceived as truths and truth idiots are perceived to be intellectuals and real intellectuals are perceived to be non-intellectuals this is the biggest tragedy of this country i said i will fight it out and that's how my journey began second this was the first important part you have to understand that truth is being manipulated, truth has been deformed and it has been served to innocent students of India right from kindergarten to the university level. And therefore in their minds they start believing that people like Ramchand Guha is telling you the correct history. If you look deeply, he has nothing to do with history, he does not even have a degree in history. That's why you will feel, you will find that newspapers and magazines will that Mr. Devdat Patnayak, a leftist, a communist who distorts Indi Hinduism, is a Hindu scholar. Whereas the real Hindu scholars are, they speak Hindi, simple people, they wear dhoti and kurta, puttika, and they live in Jabalpur, they live in Raipur, they live in uh, Banaras, they live in Ilabad, and nobody cares about them. They are not invited on television channels. They are Their columns don't publish in Times of India. Nobody cares about them. We have ignored our own people, so I said I'll fight for them. And this is how my journey into Lal Bahadur Shastri's life begins. 
second thing i questioned why we always have to choose between mr pandit jawaharlal nehru or ambedkar sahab or somebody else why the people of this country don't know anything about rajin why nobody knows about shama prasad mukherjee ji why nobody knows about lal bahadur shastri ji why we have forgotten about these people zameen se jude jo log hain jo colonial mindset ke nahi hain jo zameen mein apni maa ke paon chhune ke baad thali ke aas paas pani dalte aur kehte maa tumne khana khaye aur fir khana khate jo shastri ji karte the rozana karte the पूरे 20-25 लोगों के परिवार के साथ खाना खाते थे तो इस तरह के लोग जो जमीन से जुड़े हैं भारतीय भाव से जुड़े हैं इन लोगों को ये देश इतनी जल्दी भुला कैसे देता है क्यों देता है आई थॉट आई फाइट विद सिस्टम एंड आई सेड व्हाई आफ्टर 50 इयर्स वी डोंट नो द ट्रूथ अबाउट द डेथ ऑफ लाल बहादुर शास्त्री एंड इफ यू डोंट नो द ट्रूथ ऑफ प्राइम मिनिस्टर्स डेथ has no right to truth in this country therefore the primary theme of the film though i have used this but the primary theme of the film is that we should have right to truth it's time that we have right to truth now coming to the book because film everybody has seen so i don't want to talk much about it. now looking at the book this book though one can think that this book is based on what is in the film but actually it is not true this book tells you what is the the primary theme of the book is that what is the role of simplicity sacrifice and spiritualism in politics of india and without these three important pillars simplicity sacrifice it is not possible for a politician without these three things it is not possible for the politics without these three things to make india a vishwa guru this is what this book is all about this book is told it's a journey between my father's secret diary and my assistant who's a young boy who's wondering what this country is all about who are we and me in the middle trying to figure out between the past of this country i am the present and the future of this country and i figure out that what is the importance of these three things because without these three things simplicity sacrifice and spiritualism we can never ever have with us so in a way this book is very spiritual book in a way this book is a very indian book in a way this book tells us that where we have gone wrong and what is the right way to follow just to give you an example you ask anybody in this country about naxalbari and naxal movement they will tell you every child every student every intellectual knows about it why do we have this marxes this maoists this nax movement reason they will tell you because landlords used to exploit poor farmers and take away their land and to free their land the naxal movement started why do we have maoists in this country people lose their land to corporates industries mining and therefore to find them justice we have this system same year when the naxal movement started in the east india in west bengal same time in the western india in maharashtra one skinny man who never wore chappals he also started a movement like this which was called bhudan movement 
Nexels, if you ask them, how much land have you freed? How much land have you got from landlords and given back to the farm? They can't answer. But this man got millions of hectares free from landlords without any violence, just by walking on the muddy path of a millions of hectares free and gave it back to the villagers. His name, name was Vinoba Bhave. Based on the principles of simplicity, sacrifice, and spiritual. And in the end, I am adding the fourth pillar of great Hindu philosophy, which is Seva. Because without Seva, simplicity has no meaning. Your sacrifice will go waste and spiritualism will never find the truth. Because the ultimate truth can be found only when spiritualism is combined with Seva. These are the four discoveries I made. And this book is about that. Who killed Shastri actually means who killed truth in this country. Right. Who killed Sanatan right. in this country. This is what it means. I would like all the young, and it's a very young book. I always address young people. My, the mission of my life is to empower intellectually, ideologically, and philosophically the youth of this country. I want to see India at least reaching the threshold of becoming Vish Guru before I take my last breath in this country. Therefore, I have dedicated my entire life to helping the youth. This book is for the youth. I want all of you to read this book and how these leftist people pick up rubbish and make that like a very popular book and they create narrative. Our biggest problem has been that we have and books. We have not invested in literature festivals. We have not invested in films. We have not taken control of narrative because we are not manipulative people. A lot of people ask me why the right wing does not have an ecosystem. I say we do not have an ecosystem because we are not manipulative people. We are not political people. We are simple people. We are inspired by our mothers. We are inspired by our family, simple family system where one man works hard and he educates not only his children, but he gets his brothers, his cousins, everybody's children to his house. And he also pays for their education and looks after them. We believe in that. We come from that system. Not the selfish, self-centered, manipulative, ambitious, Western invade somebody else's country and home and take their resources and everything from them and fool them. We do not come from a system where we want to rule people's minds. We come from a system where we want to share all our knowledge and experience and which is why you will find the biggest mantra of Hindu philosophy has been that knowledge has no copyright. Copywriting is the Western system. Spreading knowledge, sharing knowledge is the Bharti system. And that's why you will see when people copy my uh, speeches or from my I am Buddha channel or my book and they distribute, I never ever object. Not even one penny I make from my knowledge. All these books are distributed through my foundation. I am Buddha foundation. Whatever I earn, I put that money into I am Buddha foundation. We help young people. And I want to make an announcement here. We are starting four scholarships of 25,000 each in next one week or 10 days. And whoever is listening, one on ecology, one on Indian values, one on Nari Shakti, Indian style feminism, Nari Shakti, and on social justice. I want people to take this money, do research and write 100 page thesis or books 
which we will publish, I'll get them published. And I want to keep publishing four, then six, then eight and 10 books every year, only by the students, not by authors. So that I help create an ecosystem. And this book has given me so much of insight into understanding that today, the most creative, most if you will find young people you'll find are in India because in the West everything is given on platter if you take the platter away they don't know what to do all their creativity and innovation goes for a toss if they don't have the comforts you shut the AC air conditioning in America and you'll find all the youth of America will not be able to do anything but in India the biggest advantage of Indian youth is that they have grown up with so much of struggle, so much of sacrifice that the physical comfort doesn't matter to them. And I would, my appeal to you would be that the physical comfort should be your last and the least priority. It is our duty. We are going through a very, very critical phase of humanity. For the first time in the history of humanity, the entire world has been locked up. This world, the requires new ideas, innovation, creativity. Today, the same thing, Jugaad, which the world laughs at, that Jugaad should become our biggest strength, our intellectual knowledge, our simplicity, the DNA of spirituality should become our main resources. And I would appeal to all the students who are associated through Think India or indirectly, to take this country forward irrespective of ideologies. Don't bother about parties or the governments. It is our country, our society. We owe it to, if nobody else, in the end, I would like to say, whatever I do is dedicated, is a tribute to the sacrifice of my mother, who wore just few saris, who eat, who used to eat, whatever was left over. As comfort of the uh, bed to us, why was she doing this? To instill great values in us. The mothers of this country, big industries, they manufacture cars, aeroplanes, roads, bridges, all those high-tech things. But the mothers of this country, they manufacture bright young men and women like you. They build characters. And without characters, no country can progress. Therefore, you should always remember the sacrifice of your parents, especially your mother, and dedicate yourself to building this country, taking this nation forward, make it a Vishwa Guru. I would request you, read the book if you like it, talk about it, make sure that if somebody wants to gift on Diwali, Holi, on bird on sweets because any anyway it is not good for health. Let's not waste money on flowers. Let's not waste money on materialistic things. Spread knowledge. Anybody's book, give that book, make books, especially the books of nationalist thinking, the books which basically give insight into Indian mindset. Take buy those books and gift it to somebody who is younger than you so that young people get inspired by you. In the end, I would like to also inform you that I'm starting another another uh, social service thing. It's called School of Creative, which I remember. All of you are welcome. This School of Creativity is based on Hindu philosophy. I have taken the core values from there, and I am teaching people how you can be creative and innovative to become successful because us have to take this country on the path of success which is possible only like i told you with the four pillars of simplicity sacrifice seva and spiritualism so all the best to all of you thanks for inviting me and joining and listening to me patiently ishwar kare aap sabke jeevan mein sukh aur samriddhi aaye jai hind bharat mata ki jai all right thank you so much uh, vivek sir for these inspiring words uh, 
could you please uh, take up some 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 of the questions okay right uh, sir many times you have spoken about the various difficulties you faced uh, while you were researching about this topic specifically about shastri ji uh, for for the tashkent files and and for who killed shastri the book you you have filed you know you have filed various itis with various government bodies but did not get any answer or or any reply i mean it is just terrifying to know that there is not even a single official record with respect to the death of india's second prime minister so uh, so sir how how did you overcome these difficulties and go about for all the research for this project so uh, okay so your question is that how when no record is available with the government of india uh, then how did we overcome these hurdles and research for this film so i did two three things number one we filed rtis we found there was no information i went to the uh, national archives parliament everywhere no information then i said that there are so many people who have lived in those times and they are not in the mainstream but they have some knowledge so i crowd source first time in, in anybody crowd source research and i crowd source research and i appeal to all the indians i said whatever whoever you know please connect me through them this was a creative idea it was an innovative idea and then you know how things happen one person connects you with the other then the somebody with the other and slowly slowly i cannot disclose everything because it's a uh, under confidence but then somebody got me the lost parliament records or confidential parliament records people started giving me a lot of articles of those times then they started putting me in touch with the people who were associated with shastri ji and slowly slowly we started building a network and we found all this information which you have seen in the film and this also gave me the uh, confidence and uh, it reinforced my belief that there is no power there is no um to the people's power if collectively we come together and try to help each other then we can achieve anything we want and i must thank the great people of india who under confidentiality helped us find the truth all right sir that takes me to the next question that uh the other day i was reading uh, your book and you have written in your book that a senior journalist uh, journalist kuldeep nayar ji just just a few months before his death chose you to disclose all the secrets with respect to shastri ji's death right about which he never sp never spoke or wrote about earlier uh, sir could you please share some insights on this i mean uh, as in uh, what could be the reasons that made kuldeep nayar ji take a tectonic shift in his stand just before his death i honest tell you what was his reason but i can tell you how it played out uh somebody put me in touch like i through crowd research somebody put me in touch with kuldeep nayar ji i had never met him before he had no idea about me i kept calling him and every time he would refuse to meet me he said i am not interested in film and uh, film people and all that i kept insisting in fact once he got angry also at me and he said please stop calling me all the times i have nothing to say whatever i have to say i have said it it's in public domain at all his uh, interviews article his autobiography everywhere he uh, wrote or gave an impression that in his mind he had no doubt that shastri ji died of heart attack do he mentioned many times that lalita ji shastri ji's wife had told him that no and he was one person who was present there and he was one of the first persons to reach there he was the press secretary so he reached there the first person to reach after shastri ji died he has written in great detail what happened at that time and he was the one who traveled back with shastri ji's dead body and he was a very honest responsible journalist there was nobody could accuse him of lying or misinforming people and nobody questioned his account also 
One day I was in Delhi. I was shooting. Suddenly from nowhere I got a call from a landline number. And with his deep voice, he said, uh, Mr. Agniotri, I'm Kuldeep Nair. And he said, can you come and meet me right now? So I said, sir, um, I'm shooting. Delhi. No, he, he said, to, uh, I said, no, I said, I can come in the afternoon. He said, no, no, afternoon, I sleep after lunch. Then he called me, I've written in the book. So I went there in the late afternoon or early evening. I went there and there were my team was there and a couple more people were with me and Lal Bahadur Shastri ji's grandson was also with me. I took him with me so that somebody from the family is there to check whether everything is perfect or not. So initially he was saying the same thing, but finally he told me how the Indian ambassador T and call kept pestering him. And he said, now I have doubt in my mind that there was definitely something was very wrong with Shastri Ji's death. I touched his feet and left and he was very old in uh, mid nineties or something like that. A few weeks, a few months, he died. This was perhaps his last interview or last time he spoke about Shastri. Why did he choose me? I don't know. I don't even know that why God chose me to make this film. Because despite all the problems, all the hurdles I've written in the book, as if somebody was choosing me to tell this story, it had to come through me. So similarly, I think all of us are mediums. When you definitely want something very, very honestly, sincerely and desperately, then I think Mother Nature makes it happen for us. I think Sri late Kuldeep Nayar Ji was one of those ways to my path. All right, Vivek sir, uh, now uh, I want to further delve into the this specific topic about Shastri Ji. That uh, this question may be seen as politically incorrect or stuff, uh, whatever. But do you think that the then government, uh, which was at place, uh, do you blame them for the cover up of Shastriji's alleged political uh, murder, or would you rather blame them for their lack of activeness in initiating a proper investigation? Because it is it is very difficult for us even to imagine that till date we are unable to find out the actual reasons behind the death of our second prime minister. See, I am neither Supreme Court of India, nor I am the parliament, nor I am the custodian of truth that I can answer it with uh, credibility. But I can tell you that now more than four or five years, and even after writing the book, and I still keep reading, I'll tell you the first time I have not spoken about it. I always said, uh, I don't know, it's written in the book or in the film. I feel that the government of that time definitely knew there was something wrong about it. 100%. But the problem was the popularity of Shastriji was so high at that time that people within one and a half years, And this, all you young boys can go and do some. I have seen the headlines of those times. Even New York Times had stopped writing about uh, Nehruji. In fact, one of the articles they have also written that Shastri has become so popular that the people of India are Prime Minister of India. It's something like that they have written in one of their articles. Everywhere, people started talking about him. People did not forget Gandhi, but people in one and a half years forgot about Nehru. And people started saying if Shastri was prime minister before uh, China war, he would have won us the war. It was showing negatively on Nehruji. On the other hand, 
Indira Gandhi had a problem with Shastri because Shastri ji became the prime minister, whereas Indira Gandhi wanted to become the prime minister. So these two things put together, there is an indirect suspicion that there was a big conspiracy in killing Shastri ji in Tashkent. Even if that is not true, the reason there was absolute no post-mortem and there were so many loopholes in the whole thing and the government of Congress never ever initiated the investigation is because Mrs. Indira Gandhi was scared that if she goes for the investigation and if some kind of truth comes out then she will not remain prime minister of this country because then the people of the country will rebel. This was her fear. And which is why you see that all the documents and the files have vanished. Which is not possible. Because the matter of the Prime Minister comes under the purview of PMO. It was not possible if the Prime Minister was not directly involved in this. This is my understanding. This is my feeling. I am not saying this is the truth. If some new truth comes out, I am going to live believing that yes, the truth was destroyed by the hands of Mrs. Indira Gandhi's regime. Right. Uh, thank you, sir, for answering this question upright. Now, uh, due to the paucity of time, we'll have to end this session here. Uh, it has indeed been a wonderful session. I thank you, Vivek, sir, for such superb insights on various aspects. Uh, I personally enjoyed the session a lot. Uh, Vivek sir, I hope you will allow us again to associate with you in future as well. And I, on behalf of Think India, wish you all the success for the book, Ukil Shastri, and your next, next project as well, The Kashmir Files. Uh, and I appeal to all the viewers out here to kindly buy the book, Ukil Shastri, and get to know that part of our history, which is unfortunately absent from the textbooks of schools and colleges. Again, uh, I would also like to thank Renu Ma'am from Vivek Sir's office for, uh, for her kind cooperation with us. Also, I would like to thank uh, Mr. Ganesh Turiraoji, uh, National in Charge Think India, Shivam, Shivam Ji, uh, Mrityan Jai Tripathi Ji, Aditya Kashyap Ji. Thank you again, Vivek Sir. Thank you, Namaskar. All the best to Namaskar. all of you. And when we announce our scholarships, I'll be very happy if uh, young boys and girls from uh, Think India get that scholarship and they do some research. All right. For sure. Sir. Thank you. Thank you.